Hello. <laughs> well, hello. This is Pastor Pete, and this is this is NPR Radio. <laughs> We would like to talk to you about cup, cupcakes and pastries. Are you doing an SNL skit? No, no. I thought it. No, no, no not that one. No. There, there is. Yes, there is okay. one. I Thank know. It just came back to my memory. For joining us for Q and A, Alec Baldwin was in. Don't give any more context for that, please. No. <laughs> Pastor Kim, Bishop Goldenberg, and PG. Here to answer your questions about the world's problems. But first, hmm. Pastor Randy should tell us a dream that he had. <laughs> I, I have not had a dream, that I could, <laughs> at least that I can remember, about Pete. But I had a, a dream about Pete last night that I woke up from. And, and, and it's he, not a good dream. No, it was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so, so in the dream, I'm giving a message, and I'm getting right down to the closing, and I'm, I'm getting all excited because I felt like, boy, this closing. This is, is it. You say, yeah. I mean, you saved some really good content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was like, man, I, I, I've plane. been waiting this whole message to give this closing, and I'm all excited. And all of a sudden, he just Christ goes, is my firm <laughs> foundation. <laughs> this music team just cuts me off. <laughs> They just start playing, and I'm like, "What?" So I can picture. So I, I have to walk off stage. You like look left, right. You're like, "Okay, I guess I'm." And you meander off the stage. So I go off stage, and after it, I'm like, "Pete, what are you doing?" And my response. His is, response was, "He said, man, you 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 were dying, dying out there, out there man. man. I'm watching the people's faces. They were dialed out. You know? <laughs> I would never, go. never." <laughs> Do you know, yeah. I've had people say to me, they think that when you all do kind of come up and start playing under him, that you're you're trying to tell him to stop. And I'm like, no. No, that's, that's She's transitioning. Of, transitioning. Yeah, transition. And you're right. Play a little time. louder. Maybe he'll shut up now. <laughs> Put up a sign. Time's done. Time. <laughs> no. No, Pastor Randy actually gives us a cue yeah, when, when he, he says, in part of our production meeting, he says, it's going to be slide 32 or slide 24, and this is the verse, and, you know, come out, and, yeah. and we transition. And of course, we have some. Except when I'm dying up there, and, and then, everybody's boom. dialed out. Then I give a sign to <laughs> the band. Then you just come on. We just come up, and we start. <laughs> you just start playing. <laughs> never. Never do that. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the very word, though. Man, you're dying up there. Every, everybody, look at the audience. Everybody's dialed out which, way back. Which, you know, that what happens in dreams is a lot of times when that happens, that's like a that's like a fear inside of you that you have, which every communicator, yes. if you've communicated at, at a high level, communicated at a high level at some point in your life and you've been on stage, there is a point. People, when they're listening to you, most of the time are not looking at you and going, yeah, yeah. yeah. Normally. Wish that were true, but it's not. The majority of the time, and of course, if you land a specific point or something, and there's there's levity, they'll respond to that. But a lot of times, they're just kind of looking at you. Yeah, it's very, it's a very neutral. And it's, yes. hard, it's hard to read them. Uh huh. Um, audiences from one service to the other can be very different. To yep. Totally different. Same exact material, they'll respond to it differently. It's an interesting thing. I I'll be honest. I move my eyes around a lot because if my eyes land on somebody on people that look like they are dialed out, <laughs> it's a little discouraging. So I try to look somewhere where somebody looks like they're tuned in. What's, what's hard too is if somebody like in the middle, like or towards the end, like gets up and walks out. You're like, did I say something? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, the coffee. You know, it hit him just right. Yeah. <laughs> but no. You do have those moments when you go, I hope this is coming out the way that I feel like I want it to come out. Or you're like, Ugh. I'll tell you another repeated dream. This is a dream I used to have at least once a year. Now, I haven't had it for a while. But in the dream, once again, um, you know, on stage, I'm giving the message. Bringing it. And as I'm giving the message, I'm falling asleep. And I'm, and I'm going to head bob. And I'm like, oh, shoot, did they see that? And, and then it happens again. <laughs> but I am putting myself to sleep with my <laughs> it's, it's It's like something, it's very hard. Again, if you haven't done it, it's hard to explain with that. Because you're like putting yourself out there, too. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's the word of God, but you are the carrier, the vessel that he's flowing through. 
So you can't fall asleep. In there's the a lot of, of bad things that can happen to you. Let's let's face it. There's, Slides. There's uh, yeah. There's the microphone. Your mind goes blank, and, and you know you feel dizzy. Suddenly, anything can happen. Your belly hurts. You start doing the Running Man, and you blow out a zipper. <laughs> Hypothetically, <laughs> not that that's ever happened. That to me. has never happened to me. <laughs> Happened to Number me. one, can't do the running man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We got a bunch of questions All here. Right. Let us know where you're watching from. We're going to talk about Israel a little bit and a bunch of stuff. Hopefully, this is actually live and we're not just talking to ourselves because it's I not know. live. It's oh, nice. there oh. it is. We're live now. Okay. Hey, there we are. So, all this gotta, time we have. Had no, an audience or no, not had there's an nobody, audience. nobody watching. <laughs> it's just the three. Well, it's probably just, the, just as well. The three of us bantering. We, we have bantered. Sufficiently. All right, let's say hi to some people real quick. Lisa Bradenberg, Debbie Tarani, Mark yeah. Oliphant. Such a cool name. Good morning. Feel free to like and share. Let us know where you're watching from. Debbie Tarani again. Sir Gosnell, my man. Roy, what's up, buddy? Gail Lewis. Have I met Miss Gail? Yes, yeah, I've met yeah, Miss yeah, Gail. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh... Bobby Mahan. I remember when Pete used to preach, I would always fall asleep so you know where you're coming from. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things they could say about me. I mean, a lot of things you could say about me, but boring is generally not <laughs> one you get a lot. Because <laughs> I'm crazy enough, Bobby, if you had fallen asleep, I would walk down there and tap you on the shoulder. <laughs> say hi to my cousin. Just Jamie, what's going on? Yeah. And Bruce oh. Murray. I don't know if I've met Bruce either. but Oh, yeah, of course I have, Bruce Murray. I've known Bruce for a long time and his family. For some reason, Murray didn't sink, just Bruce. He's a bass player, too. Oh. Good man. Okay, all right, let's dive into some questions. Let us know where you're watching from. No, Pete was awesome. All right, yeah, it's too late, Bob. You done broke my heart. <laughs> you were like a brother to me. Only time will heal this wound. Pastor Kim, you want to fire? How about the one, I think this was left over from last week. So in terms of Israel and Palestine, the person is saying they're confused because isn't this a religious war? So why is America involved in this? Okay, well, America is involved because we are Israel's number one ally. And we also have special interest that the Middle East stays as peaceful as is possible. Okay, so it's a complicated world. So that that's our main interest in Israel. Uh, I wish, frankly, that we were we were even more involved than we have been. Nevertheless, we we've been involved. Now, to say that it's a religious war is kind of true and kind of not true. It, it is not per se a clash of Islam and Judaism. Okay, so that, that, that would be a religious war. It's not. It is a turf uh, war in that, um, you know, from 70 A.D. When, when Israel was spread all over the world, you know, Romans came and conquered uh, Jerusalem, tore down the temple. They ceased to exist as a nation. Then in 1948, after Hitler tried to decimate every Jew alive, um, they were reborn again as a nation in 1948. So they were given. Bible predicted that, that. And, and the Bible had predicted both their scattering and their their regathering. Um, they were given that little piece of land that had been theirs way before Islam came into existence. Islam didn't even come into existence until about I think it was six ten or six twelve, Muhammad started his his journey. So they owned the land because it was given to God to Abraham and Abraham's ancestors way back in Genesis twelve. Uh, the boundaries are given even more specifically in Genesis 15. So people don't know history, and particularly biblical history, so they assume, oh, wow, so the Palestinians were living in that land, and the Israel came and kicked them out. Well, that's, that's not at all what happened. The truth is there were already some Jews living in that area. There were some Palestinians, which was a name that didn't even exist through most of history. But, but anyway, so... It's, it's a turf war, but it does have an undercurrent of, of religion. Mm -hmm. But it's not primarily a religious war. You know? I'm not... I'm so <laughs> no, no, he's over here giggling with his face. He's got a giggly face. I, all I can think about is me actually saying to you, you were dying up there. You were dying up there, man. You were dying. That's, that's never Did you see the audience? They were dialed <laughs> out. Two Ds. <laughs> Dying up there, and the audience dialed out, which tells you what goes through my psyche. Because like, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, we always like touch base. We we'll, like coming on the stage, and I say something, yeah. you know, like bring your A game or something right. right before right. you go to preach. <laughs> yeah. And from now yeah. on, it's going to be, hey man, man, don't die up don't there. Die up there. <laughs> They're if dying. I see, if I see them dialing out, I'm bringing on the music. Christ <laughs> is my firm foundation. <laughs> 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 the 
just, I'll shake it. I'll yeah. pull it together, but that's all I can think about right now. You know I'd never say that. Never. In well, a, in I certainly hope years. not. Man. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's turn it subjects, because this one was from last week, too. It's okay. in our comment section. Mm -hmm. I think we had talked about giving uh, at some point, and so the person says, what about giving to the church when one spouse doesn't oh, yeah. want to? Oh, that's such a sticky situation. I, I, I'm going to say something that probably most pastors would not say. I don't think you should give if your spouse is having a hard time with it. I, I think it's wiser to be patient. Um, you know, if you have some kind of personal income and you choose to give out of that and, and it won't offend your spouse. But I think that's an area that is unnecessarily disturbing. Um, it kind of turns people away from Christianity that don't understand things. So I, I, I would say, even though your spouse is not a Christian, this is a case where I would submit to them. And, and I, that, that's just my opinion. Your marriage is that important. There, there, there are many other pastors mm -hmm. who would probably say something completely opposite they would say oh, oh no you you put the lord first no matter what now there are times if if the spouse says okay i forbid you to go to church or i forbid you to read the bible or mm -hmm. or to serve christ well then i'd say no that's where you you draw the line but it's something like this it's it's such a sensitive area and so many um cheap shots have been cast upon the church through you know the church christ through the ages about about this subject I wouldn't give them more, more in, you know, ammunition for that. So. It could make them more bitter towards the church, yeah. mm -hmm. make them hate the fact, resent it, it the fact that you It could close the door permanently. Absolutely. You know, it, it gives them, oh, yeah, see, that's all they care oh, about. Oh, so they just want your money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with 100%. How about, how about I mean, let's tweak the question, question a little bit. What if your spouse is a Christ follower? I'm not saying it's different, but let's just say your, your spouse is a Christ follower, but they don't want to give. I think that's where you, you have um, a very open-minded, uh, biblical conversation. conversation. Now, I would let them go first. I'd say, can you explain to me why you feel, as a Christ follower, you, you describe yourself as a Christ follower, why you don't want to give or you, you feel that God doesn't you know, desire you to learn how to be a giver like he's a giver. So help me understand your thought process. That, that would be... But I think they could discuss it and hopefully come to some kind of compromise. It might be a season in their life. It might be that the one spouse is so concerned about the bills, they're just barely surviving, just barely getting by. Yeah. And they feel like, hey, if we gave, you know, we, we go under. And so that's where, you know, some kind of a compromise and patience, yeah. you know, can, can be worked out. Baby steps. <clears throat> but it is yeah. a different conversation. It is very different. Yeah. Different conversation. Totally different. All right, I don't remember if we did the top question last week about uh, understanding God's heart when talking to Moses in Exodus 11. I, went, I, don't I think, remember it was there. I don't, I don't think, think we, we got okay. to it. No. So th this person wants to I think you were struggling with it, too. Oh, uh, it's not an easy one. <laughs> okay, God's heart in Exodus 11, when God talks to Moses and lets him know that all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. To me, my father's compassionate, loving, merciful. I can, cannot explain this in my heart. Can you help me? Yeah, okay, we, we have to look at a number of things at once. <laughs> Can okay. I say something first? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to like the answer. <laughs> am, am Probably I, am, not. Am I right? Yeah, I think you're correct. The okay. sovereignty of God is something yeah. that we struggle with. The, 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 we, yeah. we overvalue ourselves and our situations. Okay, there you go. I said it. Now well, tell them what they don't want to hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there's there's really so many overlapping issues. Okay, so so number one, uh, and I know this is going to sound stupid, but everyone dies. Uh, okay, that that's the reality. Um, sin has caused us to degenerate to the point that that spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically we we die. We are in a deterioration process. Some of us die uh, quite young. Some of us die quite. What we consider quite old. It's really not old because we were meant to be beings that have the potential for Im immortality. So okay. where do you fall in that? <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. They're dying out there, man. <laughs> Give them something. <laughs> they have dialed out. I mean, you gave... You, gave you couldn't them. see they have dialed out. They give it back. Yeah. <laughs> Give it back. Uh, okay, so... The other thing is this, that um, as God describes himself, one of his descriptions of himself is that he is the judge 
of uh, both angels and humans. He's the judge of, of uh, all the universe. So in his judgments, he at times in human history, um, he ends people's lives. Now we say, oh, that's not fair. Well, we're not God. You know, he, he has better motives always than we do. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher, it says in Isaiah. So, so we have to contemplate that, that God is always kinder than me. He's always wiser than me. He's always seeking the, the highest good. So I, when I see something that looks uncomfortable to me like this, uh, the, the death of the firstborn, I say, you know, I, I don't know everything. God does. Now, in this particular case, and I'm going to say something that could create a firestorm here. <laughs> um, yeah. You're saying they're not going to like it? Well, it, it's very controversial, but I, I'm just going to say Oh, okay, more controversial. Okay. Right. So we're dealing with the nation of Egypt. The, the Egyptians worshipped all kinds of false gods and false goddesses. The ten plagues were um, directly launched at the ten major gods of the Egyptians to show that they are inferior to, right. to the one yes. true God. All right. The plagues so were the, re representations of them. Exactly. So Most don't know that, I don't think. Probably, probably not. Okay, so in, in that context, he's trying to liberate the people of Egypt from their bondage to uh, idolatry. And he's trying to awaken them to the truth, uh, who, who the real God is and what the real God is like. To do that, he has to carry out these judgments to humiliate these false gods of Egypt. All right, in that context, too, um, you, you, you have to look at the fact that I'm trying to say this carefully. These children that died, um, many of which would have died before the age of accountability, not necessarily. So you could have been a firstborn. I know you're going. An adult. But, but let's say that the majority of them were children. And we say, oh, that's terrible. These children, were their lives were taken. Not if. Well, here's the thing. What we find in Scripture is a principle of God's activity that if if a person hasn't reached what we call the age of accountability, and um, meaning that they their moral abilities to to make decisions, they don't know right from right. wrong. You know, we know that children at a certain age, they you, you watch two little two or three year olds play together, they'll steal each other's toys, conk each other on the head. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. <laughs> But they reach an age, and it's different. Some kids reach an age of accountability quite young, might be six or seven, where they really know right from wrong, good from evil. Some it's much later. But here, here's what Scripture indirectly teaches, that if you die before the age of accountability, God in sovereign grace can mm -hmm. take you to be his own. We have an illustration of this in the life of David. David commits a sin with Bathsheba. Uh, she gets pregnant, uh, the child is born, but the child is very sick. David is praying, fasting, praying, fasting. The child dies. Nice. David gets up, <clears throat> acts like nothing's wrong. His servants are like, we don't get it, man. You were so sad yeah. when the kid was sick. You're praying, you're fasting, and now you're up like nothing. David says, well, the child will not come to be with me, but I will certainly go to be with the child. Now, David is a prophet. He is saying, absolutely, this child is with the Lord. And I will someday go to be with the child. So, the child, Not because of a profession of faith. No. No, because the child never got the chance. It, it was just an infant, probably weeks old, the best we can tell. So this principle of the age of accountability, you also have it in the nation of Israel. Now, you can't apply it directly. But in the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14, uh, the Israelites get to the promised land. Moses sends out the spies. The spies <clears> come <throat> back. They say, yeah, man, just like God said, it's a great place. But <laughs> there's these giants there. There's the, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and so on. So they say, we can't. We can't fight them. We can't beat them. This is crazy. So God says, okay, okay. Then you'll stay in this wilderness. However, your children that you said would die, because that's what, that was the Israelites' reason. They said, you're just going to have our children slaughtered, you know, if we go right. and try to fight these kids. He says, your children that you said would be slaughtered, in fact, they will inherit the promised land, but none of you that would not trust me will inherit it. So the, the age? Cut, the, yeah, this is what's wild. <clears throat> it was 20 years old and, and under that were not considered accountable. Now, were they morally accountable? Surely, but in this particular case, evidently, they couldn't make decisions. But, but I'm just trying to present that we have this principle in Scripture. It's not, it's not given a great deal of focus, but knowing the heart of God, we know that before a child especially would reach the age of accountability, 
it would be appropriate for the Lord to take that innocent child to be with himself. Now, why am I saying all this? I am saying that these Egyptian children, that, that it was highly unlikely they would have, in numbers, become followers of the true God. God in, Yet. His, God in his sovereignty, he took what looked to us like a judgment. He's taking some to be with himself. Now, because of all the activity, the judgments of the false gods of Egypt, the opening of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army, it, it is conceivable that some of the Egyptians did come to see that the, the, the true God was, was um, the God of the Israelites. We know that Joseph moves back in later on, and it looks like there's a contingency that might have been, you know, receptive to the God of Israel because of all these activities. So I know it's a long answer to... Um, a question that, that was seemingly simple but not simple. And so the, the point I'm, I want to make a little more clear is that sometimes God's judgments look harsh to us, but in fact they're not as harsh as, as they appear on the surface. I'll give one more illustration and I'll stop. Let's just pretend that uh, you tell your little four-year-old, you know, to play in the front yard or whatever you do, don't go outside the gate. Uh, don't go outside the fence because you live on a street that's a busy street. Car there, yeah. Cars are parked in front of your house, and but then there's the busy street. So one day you look out the window, sure enough, your little four-year-old is, is gone outside the yard. They're walking in between two parked cars, and you see another car coming down the street, and you know that car is not going to see your child when they come out in between the two parked cars. So you, <clears throat> you race as fast as you can, and you're getting, the car is almost ready to hit your child. The only thing you can do is literally lunge Dive. through the air yeah. and tackle your child in hopes that you'll land in the right direction to save your child. So you save your child. You're scuffed up. The child is scuffed up. Now, here's the problem. Your neighbor across the street looks out the window but never sees the oncoming car. Just sees All the neighbor your child. sees yeah. is you tackling your child. You're, you're a full-grown adult, and you're... You're, and so they, they call the police on you. Now, you were actually trying to save your child's life. I'm saying that there are many circumstances in the Bible, in the Old Testament in particular, where God's intervening in ways that look shocking and violent. But, in fact, there are, it's kind of a rescue mission. I'll give you the greatest one of all, the flood. <coughs> the flood looks like, oh, wow, you're going to kill everybody? Except, are you that angry? You know, Except for, you know... Um, you know, Noah and his family, and but but the truth is, it was a rescue mission. It literally says he's the last righteous guy on earth. Had he not been taken and you know secured through the flood, well, the righteous seed that is prophesied in Genesis chapter three that will come, we know as Christ, that lineage might have been destroyed. So a lot of times, God's God's activity that looks violent on the surface might actually be urgently required. And it's a rescue type of a, a mission. So, said a lot about that. I, I don't know that it makes it feel any easier. No, but it, it is. There's clarity there because we think of our life. I don't know. I think a lot of people think of the, uh, their life as, as as all there is. And for mm -hmm. for a Christ follower, I was having a conversation with a friend last night whose whose mother um, was a Christ follower but passed away yesterday, and and. Um, he he just has the perspective he understands he he's like i'm sad but like she is happier than she's ever been like she is she is in her glory because if if you can get to the per, to the place in your life you understand the perspective that our life you ever seen those radars i love that little beep mm -hmm. beep beep like our life is one blip on the radar screen mm -hmm. of eternity and but we we yeah live so much focused on that so much so focused on it that we we can lose the whole plot so if if what you're saying is one of the options which i i was going to ask that specific question mm -hmm. that there is a chance that some of these children actually received the gift of eternal life mm -hmm. instead of 50 more years on yes on the uh, on yes. earth in a fallen world yes. which which would which would you take exactly i i think you make a great point. I, if, if we were to be able to see what happens at death, or if we were to be able to see the other side, I think our, our ideas about things would be completely different. So yeah. trivial. Everything just seems so trivial. Yes. I mean, you know, you, you see little glimpses in Scripture like uh, as Stephen is being unjustly killed because of his devotion to Christ, suddenly as his spirit apparently is about to pass out of his body, he, he already sees Jesus. 
And so his transition would have looked for, from an outsider standpoint, what a horrible death. Yeah. When they stone people in biblical days, they put you down in a pit and they grab rocks this size. They, they weren't like that size, you know, they're this size and they're hurling them down on you. So it was a horrible, horrible death. But in fact, his spirit is, is entering into the very presence, the very kingdom of Christ. The, remember the old movie, Ghost? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a dark movie, kind of a cool movie, but remember how period... <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I, that, well, that is, yes. You wish I had, though. <laughs> yeah. Might have been better for both of us, yeah. I think I'm scarred now forever. <laughs> But uh, Just grab your coffee slowly behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you you would see people's spirits leaving, you, you know, mm -hmm. their bodies very much intact, and like. That. And of course, we we know today we have hundreds, if not thousands, of these out of body experiences that I think are God's grace to us in this day and age to let us know, no, your spirit, your soul continues on. Come on. And so. Though it feels to us like this life is everything, it, it really is not. But it's, it's, it's hard for us not to feel that way. You know? We get caught there. Oh, yeah. That's Keep us question. rolling. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. We, we, yoga. Uh, yoga. So yoga. some Christians say no, that is yoga. Is it like Yogi Berra? Yogi, yoga. Berra or yoga. No? Some say that yeah. yoga is witchcraft or it's worship of other gods because of the origins of yoga and that even the poses themselves or you're opening yourself up to the <clears throat> deity. But others say uh, if you don't do the religious aspect of it, you simply use this exercise, stretch, and so forth. It's harmless, so mm -hmm. just curious. I, I, I go with the latter, that um, unless you are directly you know, doing, doing the mantras and things mm -hmm. like that, you're, you're not endangering yourself. You're not participating in the worship of false deities. You're just using it as exercise. Um, you might accidentally, in stretching, hit a yoga pose. You don't even know it's a yoga yeah, pose. Right? Yeah, just exactly. Yeah. So that's not going to open you up to demonic activity. Mm -hmm. But you, you I, I'm going to say something, and I, and I hope I'm not too late. Whatever it is, it's already a mess. Trapping somebody else. But, but in my opinion, it is extremely hard to open yourself to demonic mm -hmm. activity. I think you have to really go Want after it, it hard. Yeah. More, more challenging than most expect. Yes. Versus by accident. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh no, I touched this, I said this, I did exactly. this pose. Yeah. Now there are, those, there are those unusual circumstances, and it's usually though, it's a family lineage where there's been a lot of occult activity, and so a child can be born into that, that house and inherit the demonic spirits that are there. But for the most part, it is extraordinarily hard. You have to really work hard to open yourself to these entities. Now, having said that, we, we shouldn't be... Playing with Ouija boards? Yeah, man. You know, that, yeah. This stuff is dangerous. You can't, you can't play with it. You know? yeah. So yoga, if Simply you were doing, doing yoga the pose. and doing the mat mantras and things like that, that's dangerous, yeah, in my yeah. opinion. You're, you're, you're entering into Hinduism then. You're opening yourself up to the 360 million gods and goddesses of Hinduism. <laughs> but up, up dog, down dog, child's pose, we're good? <laughs> I, think, I think, I <laughs> think. I do. Long as you don't. I, mean, I do <laughs> yoga, so I hope so. But yeah. I, I do uh, uh, beginner videos, and, and it's ones that they are talking in terms of physicality. You know, like it's like, like you're having to work out at the gym, stretching yeah. this muscles and yeah. those and your hip flexors and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, though, sometimes they will do the little namaste. And I'm like, nope, turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cut you off. I'm like, no, I'm not, not, namaste what nobody. Does, what does that even mean? Um, is that yeah. the light in me that says something to the light in you or something like that? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I'm going to look it up. I think that's Actually, somebody go ahead and drop in the comments. What does yeah. it mean? I'm not going to look but, it up. Uh, you can look it up. Yeah. Well, let's go to the next question while, while we're getting okay, the answer so to that. Okay, so the Bible says to honor your father and your mother, but as an adult, do you, uh, what do you do when your parent is continuously disrespectful to your spouse? Wow. Um, Slap them. You know, uh, as, as respectfully as you can, you, you tell your parent that that's not acceptable behavior mm -hmm. and yeah. that if we're going to continue to interact, you, you've got to treat my spouse with respect. I, I don't really care what you think of them personally, but at least when we're together, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's... That has to be in place. Um, if not, we'll probably have to create some boundaries. That I, I don't want to create these boundaries. You know, I, I don't. I don't want to have a rift in the family. So that that would be what I would suggest. That was that was my next question. Mm -hmm. 
if they refuse to be honoring, mm -hmm. do you create distance? And I think, and I think the answer is yes, but do so with in with, an honorable with, way. Yeah, with gentleness and caution, mm -hmm. and and leave the way open where Absolutely. maybe yeah. a few months go by and you say, hey, can we can we revisit this? Yeah. is it possible that because this is just lousy for everybody involved? And then if it's still bad, well, then you, you have to keep the boundary in place. Yeah. 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 I think no, it, it, to honor someone doesn't mean you can't address issues and point out things. It's just you do it in an yes. honoring way as opposed Absolutely. to yes. rude and disrespectful and demeaning way or something. You know? Yeah, and, and you can completely disagree with them. But you, yeah. you say, look, I, I love you and I respect you, but this is an area where we're not in agreement and you're <clears> going to have to respect. I'm an adult now. You know, yeah. I have my own family. And that, in God's eyes, is supposed to, you know, be what, what comes first. Yeah. E even though I'll all, you always been my mom, my dad, you know, your yeah. opinion will always matter to me. But in this case, I'm not going to let it govern me. You right, know. Right. I think this next question is closely related. Maybe the same answer. We have a close family member that we feel an evil presence around. Constant abuse, physical, verbal, and other types. We do not feel like we are in physical harm, but the emotional, verbal language is definitely not from a pure heart. Question is, what would you recommend in this situation? Is it biblical to cut 100% of all ties? It goes longer than that, too, but that's yeah, the Yeah, I, I read that one, and I read it over two or three mm -hmm. times. And it's, it's one of those that I really wish this person would call me. It's too complicated for mm -hmm. me to just air an opinion on right. without knowing a little bit more of the facts. and the complex Because there's complexities in it that they want to stay in a relationship <clears throat> with another person who this person is in an intimate relationship with right. and, 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 and as to the impact on their children. Well, I don't know what that impact is like. I don't you know what really age the children are. Things. Yeah, so th this is one of those things that's just so personal that you have to know all the details before you can really give a, a solid biblical answer. Yeah. 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 That's all our questions. Wow. Dun -dun. Sorry. Mm -hmm. dun -dun. Wow. Did we, did we ever Should come we up with Namaste? Uh, yes, yeah. it means I bow I to you. I didn't just ask a demon to come oh. into me, did I? No, <laughs> it means I bow to you. You want to see something cool that I can't show them, but I can show you guys? I know you don't have your glasses on. No, don't. But do you know what that is? I don't. You can't say it out loud. I don't. You don't know what it is? No. Not without my glasses. That's what I thought. Oh! Oh, I thought it was some kind of satanic symbol. <laughs> 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 no, those are. Okay. I'll show you some okay. other time. That's why Very I got quiet cool. all of a sudden. He just he just messaged me that, but I can't I can't tell you what it is. No, it was a good thing. It, it, it was not a satanic symbol. <laughs> no, it was not a satanic symbol. <laughs> no, back to Namaste. So what does it mean? It means I bow to you. Is what oh, Google says. I bow to you. I bow to you. Well, that doesn't sound too sinister. Nah. Still, I'm going to go with God bless instead. Yeah. Okay. Have it your way. <laughs> why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us what the latest is on Israel? <coughs> well, it's a little uh, high level. Of course, you know, most people know that they were attacked by the Iranians, uh, which turned out to be a humiliating experience for the Iranians because 99% of the missiles and drones and so forth were, were nullified. But then Israel. 300 landed, 300 didn't take off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it turns out <laughs> about half of their ballistic missiles, it sounds like, and their cruise missiles didn't even launch correctly. Uh, Israel retaliated, but it was a very delicate tactical. It was only three missiles, but <laughs> they landed them right by their nuclear factory to let the Iranians know, anytime we want to come, we can. You don't see us. You don't know when we're coming, and we can take out anything we want to take out, but we don't want to escalate. Mm -hmm. It was a, a really brilliant um, kind of a response. I, I was surprised. I expected it was going more, to be more he heavier, yeah. heavy, more heavy handed. I think the influence of the United States probably played a, a, a good role in, in this, this case. Uh, I had anticipated there was going to be a bit of a ping pong match for a while between the Iranians and, and the Israelis. It appears now that may not be the case. Now, what I do still expect to happen, once they finish off Hamas, which they're, they're ready to do now, they, they've got Essentially, all of their the Hamas military trapped in Rafah, and they're they're ready to go in, and they they will absolutely go in and finish them off. Hezbollah keeps aggravating them from the north. Israel has retaliated, but but very carefully. In my opinion, once they finish off Hamas, they are absolutely going to go completely to remove um, Hezbollah. 
because you got 500,000 Israelites that are, are essentially homeless because they can't live in those northern lands because mm -hmm. they're constantly being you know, bombarded by these missiles from Hezbollah. So I think that's going to be the next stage, and that will be dangerous. But, but that, that, that eliminates the two essential Iranian proxies that they were just aggravating Israel to death. I mean, they're just constantly lobbing missiles yeah. at them. So at that point, it becomes um, humiliating for Iran and will probably ratchet up their anger, which I think will lead to the ultimate confrontation. Once they can get Turkey as a partner, which Ezekiel 38 says they will, along with some other Islamic nations like Sudan and, and uh, I think Libya is another one on the list, that um, they'll want to strike Israel when they feel they have confidence and competence to do it. I think they know right now, technologically, they can't, they can't fight with Israel. No. It's, it would just be such a mis mismatch, you know. Yeah. But they're angry, and they would love to destroy Israel, but I think they know right now they can't, at least not on their own. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the reason this, this future war in Ezekiel 38 is such an unusual thing is because it involves Turkey. Turkey will be the big partner, according to Ezekiel 38, with Iran. Now, Turkey is a member of NATO, which really complicates this thing. We have a nuclear <laughs> facilities there. Now, the Turks don't have their hands on the nuclear switches. We do. They're ours. Nevertheless, it's a very complicated situation because what happens? technically if a NATO member is involved in an attack, which, you know, in Ezekiel 38, it will be Turkey and Iran with, you know, Sudan and some other Islamic nations that attack Israel. But Israel, they're not going to sit there. So we're assuming a, a, a retaliation of some sort. So that would be retaliating or attacking NATO. a NATO member. Yeah. However, Ezekiel 38 does open the door that the, the response might be totally of God. It might be God himself that, that firebombs this army in some way. It could also be that it could be uh, nukes that come from the United States. <laughs> I mean, because it, it's a fiery uh, judgment that falls upon these armies that come upon Israel. And uh, that it's, it's so bad that literally their, their weaponry is, is left for seven months, and the Israelites are going around marking places where it's at to keep people away. Well, that sounds like nuclear contamination, you know. You know. But we don't know. We don't know. So there's, there's a lot of unknowns there. But I think that for now, the next thing to watch for, in my opinion, and I could be completely wrong, the war to the north. Is going to heat up, and they're they're going to Israel will go after Hezbollah because they're just kind of left without choice. Now, if Hezbollah dials it way way back, goes into hiding or something. Yeah, I mean Israel may just sit sit tight. Uh, if they get into this big exchange with Hezbollah, the thing to really watch for is the fulfillment of Isaiah 17:1, because you're talking about. Syria and Damascus, the, the, the oldest functioning city in the world, is going to be utterly destroyed, according to Isaiah 17.1. Well, they've already hit. Uh, when the, the thing that triggered this Iranian response was Israel blew up, I think, two or three of these um, generals of um, you know, the, the Iranian guard. What do they have? The, the, the Republican guard, I think they're called. So they've already struck Syria, and they've struck Syria a number of times um, as they're hitting Hezbollah. But it could be that it becomes the, the actual decimation of, of Damascus, and that's a big fulfillment of prophecy mm -hmm. as well. So we'll, we'll see. Just keep your eyes on the Middle East, though, because we're, we're living in times that um, the Bible points to and says mm -hmm. these are the precursors to the return of Christ. Very cool. Um, do you want to engage that? I don't know what I, what I was... Oh, I know there's any others involved. You guys just join shortly. Um, you know, I'm not sure what your thoughts are, other than my limited understanding of yoga is that you know it can be nothing more than some very very good stretching exercises, but it can also include. Mantras and yeah, ma this is for ma Phoebe. Who ma asked the question ma about mantras and and a definite intentional seeking of of spiritual experiences with spirit other spiritual entities that are associated with um, Hinduism. Now, so, I, I I mean you know I'm not from India. There mm -hmm. there may be a lot that I don't know. You know. Yeah. Our our premise, Miss Phoebe, was that the act of actually stretching 
uh, and and is not necessarily negative, but the spiritual elements of it can be incredibly dangerous and and to uh, not engage in the mantra side of it. Was that a good summary? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I mean, that that's my perspective with with <clears throat> limited knowledge, but still some knowledge about this that I think is safe. Oh yeah. So you feel free to weigh in there. Why don't you give them a little uh, smeagle, smidgen, okay, smackle. <laughs> Sometimes as human beings, we don't know why we do what we do. We we don't understand that we have a problem. We 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 know we don't feel exactly right, but we try to comfort that or extinguish that and so then we end up complicating our lives with all kinds of distracting desensitizing activity but the real problem won't go away yeah and so it just leads us further and further down a, a negative trail so what we want to get at in the message this week is, is we need to hear something from god god is literally the only one that can relieve us of some damage that we've done to ourselves on a, on a deep inward spiritual level that will not go away uh, other than hearing these words from God himself. And we have to hear it in an experiential way. And, and so that's what we'll talk about on Sunday. Words every soul, soul needs to hear. Needs to hear. Yes. It's been a great series. You've, and be honest, you've enjoyed teaching it. I have. And, and, and I'm going to tell you the honest truth. When I started the series, I was thinking, oh, man. I'm not going to like this at all. This, <laughs> this is not going to be fun. Which again, uh, if you if you have not communicated, they have no idea what that yeah, feeling is like. No, I mean sometimes you do a series because you you believe that people really need to hear this this part of the whole counsel of God. Um, but some parts of it are easier than others. Some parts of it are more enjoyable than others. And I was thinking this one was not going to be Kale. as enjoyable. But I have to admit, man. God has kind of taken me somewhere in this one that I didn't expect, and I am loving every second of it. I really am. Oh, let Phoebe finish. Don't cut her off. Okay. Which, this is Pastor Randy. I can't get enough of your understanding of the word. I concur with you. I am alarmed by the dangerous manner how yoga seems to have taken over Christian values in their practice. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. the affirmation. Yeah. But, yeah, there are times that you feel like you've got to give them, like you want to give them ice cream. Like you want to give them sweets. <laughs> yeah. You know, but well, you got to give them kale. You got to you got to open up ah, and shove it down their throat. Well, it, uh, all right, I'll I'll give another secret that speakers have. Mm. There are certain themes that we deal with that maybe we've dealt with them so frequently or so often that they're I don't want to say they're boring to us, but they're they're not as exciting as some other themes. Absolutely. Maybe. And that's what I was fearful was going to happen in this series, but. I couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah, you've enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, because because again, the an interaction with me in, in the processing of this, which is always what I look forward to, man. Every week, I, I don't know what happens on Sunday morning half the time, <laughs> but I can tell you one thing: <laughs> all week long, I'm loving life when I'm when glimpses of him and and new things about him, his way and his will. So anyhow, who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> we froze for a second there. We did. Look at that. Love the series. All right. Plan to join us this weekend. Yes, for the women's event. It is. Later Friday night, Saturday, and it's not too late to register. fcfchurch.com slash events. Join us. Do it. Join it's going to be awesome. And then I saw Eric Light making fun of me. Yeah, yes, softball. softball is this weekend. I will probably not be there, but uh, we have four teams in the Frederick Church Softball League. Blue, red, green, and white. And and they will all be playing this weekend. I do, I do not think that we will get rained out. They've been rained out mm -hmm. three weeks in a row, I think, or two weeks in a row. But yes, the last time we played, my kids kept yelling, "Hit it all the way to the grass, Dad!" Which is about thirty feet from where you start. <laughs> so, the good news is I'm managing their expectations. It's there that's you go. the key. So when you finally really get a hold of one, they will be wow yeah. for the rest wow. of their life. Eric said, make sure everyone comes out to see Pastor Pete and the fellow church softball players tomorrow night. Pete might hit one to, to the grass. The grass. <laughs> you know what, Eric? You were like a friend to me. I officiated your wedding. Happy to do this to me. <laughs> love you, brother. On the red team. It's a good group. So we love you, FCF Church. Plan to join us 9-15, 11-15. Fantastic things are going on. 
Come to the women's conference. It's going to be incredible. One of my, two of my favorite speakers are going to be there. One of the women are going there. And, not and uh, it's going to be, <laughs> not by Sandy. <laughs> It's going to be fantastic. And then, yeah, if you want to come out, 6.15 or uh, 8.15 are the softball games at Pine Cliff. I want to say Pine Creek, but it's Pine Cliff Park. Cliff? Pine Cliff Park. So we love you. We will see you on Sunday at any point now. Faith! No, Leslie. I know. She's got to, I don't know what she's doing over there. <laughs> you got to get a